Okay, this is the eighth and actually final lecture of our series on transient signals on transmission lines, which as we've been talking about is critically important in order to understand uh, digital circuitry, um, particularly at uh, especially high speeds or for very long cables um, or anything in which the physical size of um, our circuit comes anywhere near the wavelength at the highest frequency that we're going to need at which point the transmission line effects become important. And if we don't consider this carefully, we may get things like false bit flips or ringing um, or waste of power or all kinds of phenomena that uh, we've been trying to mitigate. But to this point, we've been considering uh, any sort of device on a circuit, be it a transistor or a logic gate, as being represented as a resistor. And if, in reality, that's not the case. In reality, any transistor, any NAND gate, any op amp, will also have um, a capacitive and possibly even an inductive load. Uh, and so we want to consider that from this perspective and uh, try to adapt our understanding of transmission line response accordingly. All right, so uh, let me just give you kind of a crash recap of capacitors and inductors and how they compare to each other. Hopefully this will be pretty familiar, um, but I'm just going to draw two lines there and we're going to do a bit of a comparison between capacitor and inductor. Okay, so the governing equation for a capacitor is that um, if we place a current across a capacitor, then there is a capacitance C of it. Um, and uh, this capacitance C is going to define how quickly the voltage across that capacitor ramps up in time. So the voltage cannot change instantaneously. You've got to place a, a current first and wait for the current to, to uh, and wait for the voltage to ramp up. And the higher that capacitance is, the slower that ramp up of voltage is going to be. So voltage does not change instantaneously. If you do want, if you want the voltage to change, the, the uh, um, effectively, the penalty is that you have to wait for the current first. All right, and C is a measure of how long you have to wait. For an inductor, we're basically just going to swap um, voltage and current. So this will be the voltage placed across an inductor will be equal to this inductance value L times the derivative of current with respect to time. This is the exact opposite. Uh, you cannot change the current instantaneously, right? So current does not change immediately. You have to place the voltage first and then allow time for the current to ramp up with L telling you how long you have to wait for, right? Big L means you have to wait a long time because a big value of L means a small value of di dt, all right? The other way to look at the capacitor and inductor as, um, is as if they were time varying resistors. So a capacitor starts off as a short circuit, which kind of makes sense because um, if you cannot change the voltage instantaneously, a short circuit is basically something that refuses to allow voltage, right? So at the very beginning, anytime you have a wave or a step change in voltage, the capacitor is going to short out that instantaneous change, um, but eventually becomes an open circuit. Right, if you wait long enough, um, and you've pumped current through that capacitor and you've charged up the voltage, eventually the voltage will take away um, whatever current you're pumping through. It will eat away all the voltage so uh, no more current can be supplied to it. And at that point, um, it's, it's cut off the current and you have an open circuit. The inductor is the exact opposite. It starts off as a short circuit. Wait, a short circuit, sorry, it starts out as an open circuit. An open circuit does not allow any volt, does not allow any current through it, but it does allow voltage, right? So it accepts voltage first. If you wait long enough, it's going to 
uh, charge up and uh, uh, pump lots of current through it, and it will do so until it uh, cancels out any voltage that you're attempting to place across the inductor. Um, so eventually, it becomes a short. because it will get you to the point where uh, the voltage across it has to be zero. And that's, that's what a short circuit does. Uh, the fact that it becomes a short circuit doesn't mean the voltage across it is zero. It just means that there's no more changing of the voltage allowed because you've charged it up. And the same for a capacitor, right? The capacitor eventually becomes an open circuit. That doesn't mean that there's no current through it. It just means that as far as the changes to the current go, it's like it's an open. Right, and that, that, that changes have all steadied out and reached their end. Okay, now, um, how long does it take for the capacitor to go from a short circuit to an open circuit is defined by a time constant. Um, so basically the transition is gonna go and follow the equation of E to the minus T over tau, right, defines the transition from short to, to open. And tau is a characteristic time constant as units of seconds. And probably you remember this from your circus class, uh, tau equals R times C, where C is the value of the capacitance and R is the total resistance that's facing that capacitor. Um, those resistances can be in series and parallel, they can branch off in different directions. But whatever is a total resistance that's facing your capacitor, that's, what's go, that's what goes in for the R. And if you multiply those two together, you get a value of tau, and that's the speed with which things are going to uh, transition. So that would look like this. E to the minus T over tau um, starts out with a value of one and falls off like this. Let me put that in color. All right, falls off like this. And at the value tau, uh, the value of this curve right here is going to be one over E. So tau is basically the, the, the time for you to have um, a one over E uh, of the way from uh, short circuit to open circuit. Uh, and that kind of makes sense because if we have a really large value of resistance, then we're slowing down the current. That means there's less current that can flow through this capacitor. Right, high resistance means not a lot of current. Um, and that is going to mean that the capacitor charged up very slowly, All right? And also same for C, a big capacitor, we said that that means dV dt must be very slow. So you're building up that voltage very slowly. And so that's also going to um, increase the time constant or drag out the process. Now for the inductor, this is going to look very much the same. We're gonna have an E to the minus T over tau. We'll define the transition. from open to short in this case. And tau, the time constant, will be equal to L divided by R. All right, and, and this should make sense in a couple ways. Again, L, if we have a really big value of L, it's going to suppress the buildup of the current. It's gonna force this time derivative to be very small. And so that means it's gonna take a long time to charge up that inductor. So a big L means a long time constant. R, however, is the opposite of what it was for a capacitor. It's in the denominator. So a big value of R, uh, what that means is that it's going to take longer to build up that current because we're suppressing um, the voltage that's appearing across the inductor. It means we, if you have, think about a resistor divider between a resistance and the inductance, if R is really big and we put one volt across that branch, if R is really big, it's going to suck up all the voltage and there's very little left to go to the inductor. If V is very small, then of course DI DT is small and it's going to take you a long time to charge that up. All right, so that's how capacitors and inductors really work. So um, these are the principles that you need to keep in mind uh, as we analyze circuits that have capacitors or inductors on the load. Um, but with these principles, it's actually not very complicated. And let's go through an example here. I'm gonna use WinTOS to show you. All right, so I'm gonna set the load to be an inductor and I'm gonna keep a matched 50 ohms on the generator just so we can simplify the visuals here. 
we're putting in one volt, which is evenly divided between RG and Z0. So a half a volt is gonna be working its way down on the transmission line. Um, and I'm gonna stop right before this hits here. So we can talk through this. Boom, okay. Uh, so we've got a, a half a volt wave that's moving its way and it's about to encounter the load. All right, now the load is an inductor. And going back to our rules, an inductor starts out as an open circuit. All right, an open circuit has a reflection coefficient of positive one. So we expect this wave to reflect with a reflection coefficient of minus one, or sorry, of, of positive one, because it's coming off of what is initially an open circuit. All right, so let me just press and step through and you can watch, there you go, right? That looks like a reflection coefficient of positive one. So the half a volt has become one volt on the load because the two half volts add up on top of each other. And we've got what looks like one volt now moving in the negative direction. Half a volt that was already there and another half a volt wave that's now moving in the opposite direction. All right, so I'm gonna um, advance a little further, but now you can see things are changing a little bit, all right? You can start to see that the voltage on the load did not stick at one volt, it's starting to decrease because what's happening is as this inductor is slowly transitioning toward being a short circuit, the reflection coefficient, which was positive one, is working its way lower and lower and lower, and it's gonna move its way toward being a reflection coefficient of minus one, because eventually that inductor is going to be a short circuit. All right, so let me just step through. And you can see here, it is decreasing. It is definitely decreasing. Um, and let's just play this out. All right, and here is that voltage on the load decreasing, All right? So the half volt is still coming in, but the reflection coefficient, which was positive one, is going to become negative one. So eventually, we're expecting the negative half a volt that's moving in the negative direction to cancel out the positive half a volt that's coming in. And the total voltage will therefore be zero. And if we just let this play out, you'll see that the voltage on the load, it is, is eventually going to move its way toward being zero. And that makes perfect sense. An inductor is going to eventually be a short circuit and a short circuit should not have any voltage on it. All right. You can see, however, that there was a transition time. Um, it took some amount of time to move from uh, one volt on the load to zero volts on the load. And that transition time you can figure out simply by taking the value of the inductor, which in this case is uh, one microhenry. And you can figure out what that time constant is by going back to tau equals L divided by R, right? So L is known, right? L is one microhenry or one times 10 to the minus sixth, but what is R? There's clearly no resistance here. Um, but however, we do have to account for the transmission line impedance, which again, even though it's not a real resistance, it's not burning energy, it is setting the voltages that are divided up um, when a wave comes in, right? It uh, um, determines how much voltage ends up on a load and how much reflects back. It's very much a part of that process. So in terms of figuring out the time constants, the load is almost like it were a 50 ohm resistance. So we're gonna take this inductor right here and pretend that the transmission line were a resistor that had value of 50 ohms, all right? In which case, sorry, that's not 50 ohms. This is uh, um, 10 to the minus sixth Henry's. All right, so we're gonna put 50 ohms right here. Um, and you can figure out what this is. This is uh, two times 10 to the minus eight, minus eight seconds, right? That is equal to our time constant tau. All right, so um, if we look at the reflection coefficient as a function of time, it's going to start out at positive one and it's going to work its way down toward eventually being a value of negative one, and this characteristic time is going to be uh, two times 10 to the minus eight, minus eight seconds. So this curve right here will be equal to two times um, uh, 
uh, times e to the minus t over tau minus, oh, hang on, um, yeah, minus one. Right? We have to, we have to uh, basically double its amplitude since it's going to go, it's going to span from minus one to one. So that's why there's two on the front end. Um, and if we, we want to center it between minus one and one, so we have to subtract that one on the end. And so that curve right here is basically the reflection coefficient on the load as a function of time. And from that, you can sort of figure out everything else and figure out the evolution of the circuit. All right, so let me play this again. And you can observe, let me speed this up, and you can observe roughly the characteristic shape. All right, and you can see uh, by the time this wave has worked its way back to the source, most of the current uh, or, or, or uh, most of the voltage change has kicked in. And so this uh, voltage and load is pretty close to being back to zero. But let's, um, let's change the conditions here. I'm going to make this one ohm here into being 10. Sorry, this uh, one microhenry, I'm going to make it 10. All right, so that should increase the... Um, time constant by a factor of 10, or it should slow down that transition. So let's simulate this now and watch what happens. Here it is, right? And you can see that uh, voltage is taking a lot longer to make that transition from open circuit to short circuit. It's gonna get there, but it's gonna take about 10 times longer. Right, you, but uh, you can see it. Let me just, just to, to see it, I'm gonna make this 0.1, so it would be 10 times faster than it was originally, and you'll see this as well. You expect a very quick uh, transition. Boom, there it is. It very quickly uh, dropped that voltage in the load down to zero, all right? In fact, uh, um, the uh, uh, actual timing of this is given here, so you can actually figure this out. Um, one point along, one tick along this uh, axis right here is 0 0.2 nanoseconds. So you can calculate what I what I uh, showed before, and you'll see that it lines up with the shape of that exponential curve, um, given the time constant of this value L um, uh, in parallel with the resistance. All right, uh, we can complicate things even more. For example, we can have a series resistor and inductor. All right, if we have a series inductor and resistor, then the effective circuit that we have at the load is going to be this resistor right here, this inductor, and then in parallel to that, it's as if we have a resistor with value of 50 ohms, All right? And so uh, this resistor right here, um, you know, let's, let's uh, just say this is 100 ohms. One hundred ohms, and this would be L. So in this case, the time constant would be L divided by R. The L comes from the inductor value, and the R would be simply the series combination of fifty plus one hundred or one hundred and fifty, right? Because this inductor basically sees both. With that, you can basically treat arbitrary configurations. If we just treat the the um, transmission line as if it were a 50 ohm impedance and calculate the time constant accordingly. All right, let me just show you the same thing for a capacitor. Right, here's a capacitor on the load. And let's simulate this and watch what happens. All right, let me stop right here uh, before we get to the suspenseful part. Um, the capacitor is the opposite of the inductor. It starts out as a short circuit and will slowly become an open circuit, all right? So a short circuit is going to have a negative one reflection coefficient. So we expect the one half volt that's going this way will immediately be counteracted by a negative a half volt going back in the opposite direction. And so let's see what happens. I'm gonna press step here. And there you go. The voltage has, is gone, right? The voltage in the load right now is effectively zero because a negative half a volt is now moving in the opposite direction. But if we wait long enough, the capacitor is going to charge up. It's going to be able to accept that voltage because right now there's lots of current pumping through that capacitor and it's charging up the voltage. 
And if we wait long enough, the reflection coefficient is going to work its way toward being positive one. When it's positive one, uh, we expect the one half volt that's going this way to be counteracted by a, another half volt that's going in the opposite direction and they'll add up to be one half plus one half or one volt. And so let's wait what happens. Eventually, this is going to reach one volt, right? Uh, same as before, I can make this 100 picofarads or 100 puffs. I'll make it into 10, and that should greatly speed up the process uh, because the RC time constant has gone down, and so it will be a shorter transition time. And let's just watch that. Yep, you can see how much faster that transition occurred. All right. Let me go back to the 100 for a second because I actually want to take a look at the current while we're here. All right, stop. Okay, I'm going to turn on the current. All right, and again, the voltage and current are now displayed simultaneously on the same plot. The current is a slightly lighter color. The current is multiplied by Z0, which means that it is displayed as the same value or one tick mark on this graph. Now the voltage reflection coefficient starts out as being negative one because the capacitor starts out as a short circuit. But for a short circuit, the current reflection coefficient is the opposite, it's positive one. And so the current, which is coming this way, will actually have more current going in the opposite direction It's going to build up on it. So while the voltage dropped to nothing, uh, at the load, the current is actually going to be doubled of what it is at the incoming wave. So let's step and let's see that in action. So there it is. Voltage dropped to zero because of a negative one reflection coefficient, but the current actually doubled because of a positive one reflection coefficient. But wait long enough, the voltage and current are going to switch places because eventually the capacitor becomes a short circuit and a short circuit does not allow current through it. So um, Let's keep this going and you'll see that they swap places. Um, and again, there's exponential curve to both of those with that characteristic time constant of um, R and C. All right, so the principles of how loads work with, volt, with uh, inductors and capacitors really just comes down to um, figure out what the resistance is that's facing your inductor or your capacitor, um, come up with a time constant, either RC or L over R accordingly, and then treat your inductor first as an open circuit and slowly become a short. Um, and then for a capacitor, um, treat that accordingly as uh, initially a um, open as a short circuit and becoming an open, um, and then slowly make the transition from one to the other. Um, if you keep those principles in mind, it's pretty easy to then figure out exactly how your circuit is going to react. Um, to a capacitive or an inductive load. All right, so we have now come to the conclusion of this section on transient signals on transmission lines. Um, again, these are very powerful and important techniques for any sort of digital logic, any uh, circuitry, particularly ones where the physical length uh, is comparable to a wavelength. And the wavelength gets increasingly small as we turn up the frequency. Uh, and so as we move to gigahertz, to tens of gigahertz, and 5G these days, for example, operates at uh, tens of gigahertz, um, these aspects become increasingly in important, um, even for very small circuits that are on the order of centimeters, um, then transmission line effects become very important. So I hope this section was useful and informative to you, um, and hopefully nicely builds upon what you learned in your circuit theory classes. Um, but in addition, adapts it um, in order to account for sort of realistic phenomena like special relativity, um, where information cannot transfer instantaneously. Uh, in the next section, the next set of lectures, we're going to be tackling uh, a different problem, one in which we have sinusoidally varying signals. And we'll be treating a transmission line in that uh, particular case. And we're also gonna see some pretty wacky phenomena that are going to come about. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll find that section interesting and exciting as well.